Good afternoon and uh, welcome to the 37th episode of the Royal Society of Medicine's COVID-19 series, which is for health professionals by health professionals. And it's designed to give frontline health professionals regular updates from healthcare leaders on COVID-19. Um, some housekeeping. Uh, there is a Q&A feature on Zoom, which we encourage you to use to pose any questions. Uh, we have received some questions in advance, which we have considered and will try and ensure we get the opportunity to put to the panel. Um, and um, with, um, without much ado, I will go straight into a little introduction to the topic. Our topic today is managing local lockdowns. Um, and uh, the recent uh, uh, media coverage about the impact of the global lockdown for COVID on the economy uh, makes it very important that we look at how we manage local outbreaks to prevent them from becoming a global issue. And um, as we are relying on the effective management of local outbreaks to ensure that we don't get to a situation where wider lockdown across the whole country becomes necessary again. So in this session, we'll be exploring how well we're able to manage local outbreaks, what we need to ensure that we can manage them more effectively, and um, what um, information, what can modeling help us, um, how can modeling help us to, to, do, to address local outbreaks. So um, without much ado, I would like to introduce you to our first panelist. Um, our first panelist is Dr. Ivan Brown. Um, Ivan is the Director of Public Health for Leicester. Um, if you didn't know about Leicester before, you know now as the first lo uh, um, local area to go into a local lockdown. Um, and Ivan will talk to us about their experience in, of uh, the outbreak in Leicester and um, implementing a local lockdown. I also have, uh, Ivan is, has been a director of public health in Leicester for some time. He's a Leicester local born and bred, I'm very proud of that fact. He's also a professor of public health practice at the Monkford University. Um, our other panelists is, uh, I have Dr. Lilith White um, Whittles, I apologize, Dr. Lilith Whittles. Lilith, uh, Lilith is an, a researcher in infectious disease epidemiology uh, with some experience in modeling and is particularly interested in transmission dynamics of pathogens. Um, She's with Imperial, uh, which has become very uh, famous for all the work that they've been doing advising governments, both nationally and internationally, on modeling the, co uh, the COVID pandemic. Also from Imperial, we have Dr. Mark Bagala, who is also an infectious disease epidemiologist, um, whose main focus is on real-time modeling and outbreak response. So I will ask them uh, to t say a little bit more about their role in COVID and um, a general interview introduction to the role of modeling before we go back uh, to Ivan. So welcome to all of you. And so Lilith, if you could um, introduce yourself in a little bit more detail. Sure. Um, so I am a researcher at Imperial, as you've mentioned, Deborah. Um, I am, well, I'm a Sir Henry Wellcome Research Fellow, or I was up until COVID happened, at which point I've had to postpone that research that I was doing, which is focused on the transmission of bacterial pathogens, and then moved to a full-time focus on um, modelling the transmission dynamics of COVID-19. And I've been based um, as part of a team that's focused on the UK um, and have been feeding up modelling results to um, various different um, government panels, including SPIM, um, in collaboration with Mark. Welcome. And Mark? Yes, yeah, so I'm also a mathematical modeller, uh, but also a lecturer at the period of London School of Science and Tropical Medicine. And uh, I've used to work a lot on flu and uh, with the COVID-19 uh, now I've been kind of focusing on trying to advise the government through uh, providing modeling advice uh, through SPIM and SAGE. Um, so mainly doing short-term forecasts uh, to inform both government and NHS response. And also um, kind of providing every week the R number. So we're one of the team providing the R numbers. The famous R numbers. Exactly. Yeah, welcome, Mark. And uh, so we'll move on to Ivan. Uh, Ivan, it's good to have you, and thank you for breaking your much-needed um, vacation. Uh, the director of the public health at the moment don't get to get much holiday. And I was saying to Ivan that most people don't know what a director of public health is most of the time. 
Uh, but of late, um, directors of public health have been very much in the news. So um, I'd like you to tell us a little bit about the experience of the uh, Leicester uh, lockdown um, and how you've, um, your role, what your role has been in, in managing that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, we've, we've suddenly uh, all become famous as local directors of public health. I see more of them on TV mm -hmm. than at meetings nowadays. Um, but clearly, you know, our, our ultimate response is about the health and well-being of our populations, uh, and, and that's where our focus is. Um, and so for me, uh, particularly, uh, being, being the first area that had a local lockdown um, imposed on us, um, it was a very, very interesting and a very challenging time. So really, by the time we hit sort of the, the end of June, I, I'll sort of take you through the story very, very quickly. Um, <clears throat> which was uh, a number of people will have heard a lot of the discussions that spoke about um, how we were monitoring uh, COVID. And there was a lot of discussion about the pillar one testing stuff that we used to see coming through the hospitals and healthcare workers. And that was what was reported in the, the daily briefings. And that's what we, we, we all got used to. Um, but sitting behind this, of course, was always um, the introduction of community testing and the pillar two data. Now, we didn't have easy access to that data. Uh, in fact, we, did, we had very little access to that data in the earliest. And as directors of public health, we always felt that, that was a, an incredibly important piece of information that we needed to have hold of. And, um, and that was a challenge. And I think the Leicester experience really points to the fact of why data is incredibly important for us in terms of managing local outbreaks. So we had had a fairly strong reliance on the Pillar 1 data. And really, the Pillar 1 data were we were hoping was sort of the canary that would tell us what was happening outside in the community. So if we start to see high levels in, in hospitals, that that would give us a really good insight in terms of what community infection may look like. Uh, where we were was monitoring that on a very close basis. And across in Leicester, to be quite honest, after the initial spike, our figures looked exactly the same as everyone else's. In fact, we were, for East Midlands region, we were slightly lower and slightly behind everyone else. Um, but at the beginning of June, um, we, we got access to numerator data for, for, pillar, for pillar two, for the community testing. Now, we didn't have the whole picture. We didn't have the denominator. I didn't know where it was or anything like that. So we were in a situation of just looking at numbers. And there was something for me as a, as, as a DPH looking and saying, well, actually, something doesn't look right here. Uh, the, our numbers just seem to be going up. I didn't have anything to base it on. I didn't know if it was more testing. I didn't know because we recently had a regional test center put in our area. Um, but my colleagues in PHE had a look at this for me and um, they sort of came back to me all, uh, about 10 days later and said, well, actually, Ivan, we think there is actually something here. Uh, we don't think it's an artifact of testing. Uh, we think that there is something that's happening within the community. Uh, and that was sort of the first that we really knew that something was going on. And typically we would ask those, those very key questions about who, what, where, when, all of that kind of information to try and understand what the picture was like. And whilst we were in that process, we were, we were convinced that those numbers were really out of kilter with the, the rest of what we were seeing in the country. Uh, and, and so whilst we were doing that, um, we called together a, an incident management team <laughs> actually, it's whilst we were actually meeting as an incident management team that the Secretary of State made an announcement, well, didn't make an announcement, in answer to a question said, oh, and we have, we have an outbreak in Leicester, and, and life was no longer the same. Mm -hmm. um, so from that point on, we had a, a huge amount of media interest, we had lots of resources that came down from central government, lots of scrutiny that came down from there. But fundamentally, we were still trying to answer those basic questions. Um, lots of hypotheses as to what it may have been, what may have been the spark. And it's interesting now, as I start to see these, these pockets that are rising up, up and down the country, we're still asking those same basic questions as what is the catalyst that is sparking this in particular communities uh, and giving such a sharp rise. So uh, a little bit of background as to where we got to. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ivan. There's a whole load of questions that can follow from what you just told us, but I'm going to set those aside for a little bit and just go back to a few friends, first principles. Um, and I'm just going to ask uh, Mark and uh, Lilith to, to comment on this. 
how do we define a local outbreak here? Um, what, has, what information do we need? What geographical boundaries do we need? We've had some questions looking at, is this by postcode? Is it by um, metropolitan area? Um, how are modelers, how are you defining a local outbreak? How are you advising people like Ivan and other directors, public health, central government, that there is a local uh, outbreak going on? Um, Mark, would you like to start us off? Yeah, I mean, there's this several way of, of seeing uh, this. I mean, one is about the kind of um, network theory. So uh, we know that uh, infectious disease goes from individual to individual through contact. So um, if all the contacts are kind of local, I think we can say it's a local outbreak. Um, but quite often, uh, you obviously, you go from one place to another through kind of a longer link. So I think it's why it's very important to have an kind of bouncing of what Ivan was saying that information is really crucial to understand. So is it a local outbreak or is it uh, actually part of a bigger outbreak uh, just for whatever reason we're picking most of the cases in, in a particular area just mm. because of surveillance. Mm. So um, I think it's why it's very important to have uh, as much detailed information as possible and uh, as uh, because it's always easy to aggregate uh, information to kind of uh, a bigger area. If you don't have information at the very fine grain level, you, you, you just cannot tell. So um, basically, to, to be able to say that it's a local outbreak, you need to have first-hand information um, mm -hmm. and being able to link. So I think I would say local outbreak is something which is uh, not linked to, uh, I would define in terms of network and linked. So if it's kind of appeared to be only local transmission. Thank you. And Lilith, would you like to add to that? Yeah, sure. I mean, Mark makes a very good point about the granularity that the data are available at are a restriction in terms of kind of how closely and locally you can define an outbreak and do modelling on that. Mm. Um, but, and local outbreaks are probably going to be ultimately um, defined by public health agencies doing traditional epidemiology, such as mm -hmm. identifying uh, transmission clusters, link transmission clusters. Um, and, but also where modelers can help is in the monitoring of different metrics um, of infection for early warning signals, such as, for example, an increase in the number of po um, positive testing that we're getting. And mm. one thing that modeling is really valuable for in this regard is helping to interpret and combine these data streams. Mm. So mm. taking account of reporting biases, um, combining different um, data streams to assess the likelihood of different explanations for the patterns that we're seeing in the data mm. and, and make predictions accordingly while incorporating the scientific knowledge and very importantly the scientific uncertainty that we have um, around disease transmission. Um, and we can also perhaps do work um, looking at the impact of um, on local outbreaks of um, the different policy triggers could have and maybe do some sensitivity analysis around that. So there's lots of ways that modeling can, uh, can help and assist in that regard. Indeed. Uh, but I suppose a, a key thing is actually the, the models very much depend on the information you get, both in terms of completeness and, and quality. And, and some of that requires very direct engagement with the local public health system. Um, there's, no, there's no substitute for that. <laughs> absolutely. So it was a, a, um, Ivan's description of the limited amount of information they were getting. Uh, the question is, were you getting more data for modeling uh, than the directors were getting, or is this, you were, the, the wasn't, we were not collecting enough information? What's your view on that? Well, I think there's, uh, there's two things. I think one is uh, how much uh, information is available. Mm -hmm. And I think probably not enough. I mean, mm -hmm. it was uh, for different reasons. I mean, I'm not, uh, it's, I know it's a difficult thing, and there's privacy issue, and there's also uh, engagement that people might not answer if you ask them too much. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, also is how much information uh, is made available when it, it's there. And uh, I think there's definitely room for improvement on this. Uh, we didn't get more, I think, that, that uh, Ivan uh, as modelers. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so I think there's two things, is what you collect, and I think it's important to try to collect as much as possible. And I think we have to talk with people which are more especially in behavior to see what's, what's the limit because we cannot ask too much as well. Mm. And the other thing is how the information flow. And obviously yeah. you have to respect privacy. You're not in this problem of uh, potential disclosure if you uh, have a very, very kind of a narrow uh, local area. You, can, you don't want to be able to identify people and things. But uh, mm. 
so it, it, these are the data sharing is a uh, very kind of difficult and important question. Indeed. Um, thank you for that. So I, I want to go back to Ivan and a, a particular point that um, Ivan made that causes me to ask the question, who's in charge? Um, you, you commented on the limited information you were getting, but also the, the, the conversation you were having with your local um, Public Health England colleagues. So who's in charge of local outbreaks? Who should be responsible for managing them? Um, how do we make what is seeming and what, should, which some part, what some parts of the media are describing almost as a fragmented public health system, how do we make that work better? Yeah, I think, I think this is such a hugely important point. I think that we, we all recognise, well, well, a number of us working in public health recognise that uh, the 2012 reforms, the Lansley reforms, where kind of we had the, the split in public health uh, between PHE and and local authorities and, and actually other areas. I think if, if this um, outbreak has shown anything, it has shown the challenges that have occurred as a result of that. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, was, I was around in the, um, the, the, the sort of uh, swine flu days um, mm -hmm. and, and uh, suffice to say it all felt a lot easier. I know it was a very different organism and, and, and it manifested in a very different way. But at least I knew that I would be speaking directly to my CCDC. Uh, the vast majority of that public health resource sat within that sort of PCT area. Um, the responsibilities sat there. So it's a much more complex picture now. Um, I think we still have the information. I still think we've got the skills there. But I, I likened it the other day to, to uh, saying to somebody, it's like, we're all trying to create this jigsaw puzzle. We all have the pieces. But unfortunately, the pieces are in different different areas and we're, we're trying to work out who's got which piece. So if you were to ask that question about who who ultimately looks after it, I would say as a director of public health, that's that's my job. Mm. But working alongside uh, my colleagues in order to do that. But we have to consider ourselves to be a single public health healthcare response to the incident rather than all the different fractured areas. Indeed. Um, so I, I'm going to put you on the spot again and ask a question. Do you think we are now getting the balance right between central and local? Um, in context, uh, Liam Donaldson, in his introduction to the um, paper that established the Health Protection Agency prior to PHE, he, he mentioned the need to have a clear line of sight from the chief medical officer to the front line. So how is that connection from your, your experience as the director of public health for Leicester, you are statutorily responsible for the public health system in Leicester. How is that link between Leicester and central government, uh, whether it's the Department of Health and, and uh, the test and trace system, PHE, um, the uh, new joint biosecurity center? How is that feeling now? Are we heading in the right direction? I think your last line there, are we heading in the right direction, is the right one. Um, I think we are heading in the right direction now. Where we started from, it seems, you know, it seems like a world away um, from where we started uh, when, when we first got put into that, this lockdown situation. Mm. That, that didn't feel like the picture. It, it, it felt uh, as, as though there was a lot of central command and control around this. And, and I think even the announcements that we've heard over the last week in terms of how we're going to get CTAS working at a more local level, we've been the pioneers of doing that type of work. We're saying, well, look, when you can't get people, we can get people. Uh, so there, there are opportunities that exist with economies of scale by doing things centrally. But equally, there is a really key and important part to be played locally in terms of trying to deliver. We're getting there. It's better than it was, but we are still not there yet. We've still got a way to go. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to take an audience question now, which is very pertinent now, and I will um, put it to, um, to you first, but then um, move on to, to Mark and Lilith for a different perspective here. So uh, the uh, audience member asks, do the panel think that from the beginning, local rather than central control would have worked more efficiently. It seems that the change is made to replace public health from local to PHE. Um, the rest of that question is not quite clear, but I, I, I believe that the, the audience member is challenging that the change creation of PHE moving from local might have been a, a, a not the right thing. Um, it's sort of linked to what we've already said about the where do we think 
with hindsight and and um i also like um I, before i'll come back to you ivan but i'd like to get the view of the modelers um with hindsight do you think that if the control had been localized which would have caused by definition a multiple out control centers would that have provided you with better data to inform the models what do you think um lilith so I'm not sure about better, whether the data would have been better because it's uh, difficult to <laughs> think about the hypothetical um, alternate universe. Mm -hmm. But one thing um, in terms of when the initial lockdown happened, what we saw very, very clearly in the different regions of the UK was that um, the eventual size of that regional outbreak really depended on the date of importation more than anything else of when COVID had arrived there. Mm -hmm. But I would also say that all the regions, especially the England NHS regions, they did see significant outbreaks and significant mortality. So um, with, the, with the ones that locked down earlier relative to their stage in the epidemic, performing better in terms of reduced mortality than other regions. So I don't know whether there, it probably would have looked like a national lockdown, even if it had been agreed locally um, right. anyway. So yeah. It's good. Um, so um, I, um, um, Mark, do you want to add anything to that before we move? Yeah, no, I think it's, it's I mean, uh, Lilith made a good point that um, we were at a different situation during the first wave. And, mm. and the thing is, um, it really depends when, where you are. I mean, if you are with an R around a one, mm. with a lot of resurgence and, and, and it's kind of bumping everywhere, you really need to have some sort of local, um, you, you, your lo local glasses and look at, at and, but if nationally everywhere you have an exponential growth, I think you don't have a lot of choice when just say just mm -hmm. of this exponential growth because if you wait too much, you wait too much, you you're going to have your uh, NHS. Indeed. Um, yeah. Okay. Right. Thank you for that. Uh, so let's let's actually moving a little bit into some more of the practicalities. We've been asked there are a lot of questions about the role of testing uh, and the role of behavioural change and 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 how that uh, uh, we we can use that to local to manage local outbreaks. So. Um, some questioners, some audience members asked um, about whether um, rapid point of care testing where diagnostics would be a game changer in responding, detecting and responding to local outbreaks. Um, and also about what the testing strategy at local level should be. Uh, should we be focusing on, on targeting vulnerable populations, vulnerable areas, workplaces that have been shown to have outbreaks, or should we really be looking at Cross entire population testing, assuming, of course, capacity is not an issue. Um, Mark, would you like to start us off on that? Yeah, I think um, so. There's different things. One is uh, um, surveillance. One is, uh, I mean, this is a loop. I mean, you have a surveillance, then you're trying to implement uh, control strategies mm. and uh, inform potentially by modeling. Mm -hmm. So I think in this thing, I mean, it's a bit like in, in, in you know, cycling where you, you know, you can uh, win a uh, Tour de France by a uh, little gain. I think here is really much into each little gain can mm -hmm. make a difference. And I think rapid testing is one of this. Uh, uh, I mean, if you wait three days for a test and if you wait a few hours for a test, it can make uh, a major difference. So this, I think, yes, I will say yes, it can be a part of, of a game changer. I'll ask Lilith to pick up the other yeah. question, which is about whether we should be targeting testing at the most vulnerable populations, the most at-risk environments, or looking at universal testing. We now have adequate testing capacity, and from the re most recent data, we're not actually using all the testing capacity we currently have. So what's your view about that? Yeah, so I mean, I was going to first make the point that obviously the answer depends very heavily on testing capacity. Um, but in, in the UK, kind of in common with quite a lot of other similar countries worldwide, um, we've seen a disproportionate impact of the outbreak in settings where there are vulnerable people, such as care homes. Um, and um, yeah, so but we know that, um, that care home residents of care homes are particularly vulnerable to COVID, both due to their age, which is now well established that age is a serious risk factor and severity of disease, um, and additionally due to the underlying reasons that they are in the care home in the first place. Mm -hmm. Care homes are high contact environments, and, and that's actually a default, an important and defining feature of the care that's provided there. Mm -hmm. um, and it's necessary to the quality of life of the residents, for example. Um, so the, um, yeah, so um, 
in order to, uh, so once COVID gets into a care home, it's going to spread very quickly because of that high contact environment, but that's not something that we can necessarily change. So targeting testing towards um, healthcare workers in that scenario where it's not possible to go for full physical distancing me measures seems to be a very, a very sensible um, course of action in my opinion. Okay. Thank you. Um, so the other part that um, uh, some of the audience members have asked, and Ivan, I'm going to put this to you, is around since the main intervention we have for controlling outbreaks besides detecting them is actually changing behaviour. So the lockdown social distancing is about behaviour. And the question here is specifically in, in response to the more recent reports about under 30s, um, believing that because they don't get significantly unwell, uh, that they don't need to abide by, abide by some of the social distancing recommendations. So um, how do we, and as a local director of public health, um, engaging with your community is a key part of your role. How do we encourage generally the entire population, but this, particularly, uh, this particular group to abide by these social dis distancing recommendations. Ivan. Yeah, massively, massively difficult, difficult point this is. Uh, and actually it's, it's really pertinent to, to some of the, the flare-ups that we're, that we're seeing. So you've got a, a community who, on the face of it at least, suffer less. Um, yeah. uh, but the restrictions that are placed on them Feel, they can feel disproportionate because they're the ones that are out and about uh, more often. Uh, you add to that mix an area like Leicester, where we've got a very, very diverse community. So we've got to meet those, that communication need, that engagement need in multiple different ways because, you know, one message will not fit all uh, in Leicester at all. So you, you've, got, you've got that challenge uh, as well. And also the, the issue around priority. So if you are um, in a, a very, very deprived community um, and actually you are the sole breadwinner or you, you've got limited resource. Um, the, the idea of potentially getting COVID or not working and not being able to have, you know, what you need to be able to, to keep your family. These are very, very difficult conversations to have with people. It's not simple, as simple as stay at home and protect everybody else. Well, I need to protect myself to mm. make sure that I've got food on the table for everyone else. So, we have to find ways that talk about community. We have to talk about, find ways that talk about the responsibility that you have to other people. You have to have, to have ways to get, talk about, you know, just doing the, the thing that's right for yourself and the opportunity that if we do this, it means that we can all move forward together at a quicker pace. So we're having to find new narratives uh, that, that reflect the situation. So particularly now in Leicester, one of the things that we're seeing is a lot of household transmission. Now, what that allows me as a director of public health to say, what's the narrative that needs to sit around there? That's really about protecting your loved ones. That's really about protecting those that are closest to you. And I need to tailor that to that. What if it's, if it's like, as in some areas where it might be a workplace, that, that requires a different narrative. Uh, you know, your work is still going to be protected, all of those kind of things. So there is not a one size fits all, and you have to tailor your messages and you have to acknowledge the, the, the other drivers that people are facing and try to, to bring those into play as well and, and, and realise that you've got to address those arguments and not just say, well, you just need to stop doing it. It's, it's a really complex piece. Indeed. And it brings us very nicely into uh, one of the questions that we've been asked, which is around the balance between legal compulsion and community spirit. Mm -hmm. We've had uh, a lot of questions from various um, uh, professional groups, from GPs, employers, um, NGOs at local level, saying, how can we help? So um, again, I, I, will, I will start with you, but I will take the question slightly differently to the, to the to modelers to ask, how do we um, engage the community in being part of the solution, not just requiring them to do things, but actually being part of the message that we deliver? And I, and I wanted to touch on specifically, because it's a particular interest of mine, and I should have declared at the beginning of this um, session that uh, I used to be a CCDC, a consultant in communicable disease control. So I was very pleased when you opened your conversation by saying that you talked to your CCDC, because that was the, that's the local partnership that is essential for public health. But um, I wanted to talk about local resilience fora. Uh, local resilience fora, uh, tell us a bit about those and, and how they bring the community to contribute to public health issues. 
So when we're speaking about our, our, our local resilience forum, this is, this, is, this is the partnership. This is the recognition that health issues do not exist in a silo, they exist in an environment. And so whether it is, you know, your police or whether it's your business leaders or whether it's, you know, um, your, your, your blue light services, uh, your local authorities, your districts, all of those players have a role in determining not only how you respond to an incident, but also have a huge role in making sure that you, you stay below that line. So, you know, an, an effective um, local resilience for it is not just there just at the time when things go bang. Mm -hmm. They're also there at the time when they're thinking about planning, preparing, determining what could happen and how you mitigate at a very, very early stage. So they, they have a very key role. Um, RLRF has been really active in our local management around, around our continuing position. And we, it has been the longest running SCG LRF uh, gold command that we've ever had, because obviously this has been running for months now. And normally they run for, for shorter periods. But again, really driven by information, really driven by data to make a determination as to next steps. And um, I'd like to pose that, uh, flip that question a bit to, to Mark and Lilith. Um, how do we bring in this sort of local intelligence about how pop the city, you know, how the community behave into your modeling? Can we? Um, how does that affect and alter the predictions and recommendations and, and interpretations of your modeling data? So if we could start with Lilith and then Mark. So we, we take account of um, various different, we tailor um, our models to local populations to the extent that we can currently. So for example, taking account of the age distribution of the population, the density of with one model I'm working on at the moment, the density of the number of care home population within that model. But yeah, tailoring models to local knowledge is incredibly important and we have been engaging with um, experts um, who work in the care home sector who have um, access to data on for example the size of care homes and the distribution of those around the country and the more information that we can get like this the, the better and more refined the models can be because it allows you to rule out uh, possibilities for example as well uh, when you're kind of uh, refining academic predictions so yeah um, it, I would say um, very, very important, and I would love to engage um, increasingly going forward. Excellent. And Mark, um, one of the characteristics of some of the areas that are either have gone into local lockdown or have been on watch, particularly in the Northwest, um, has been the, Im the impact of the role of intergenerational families in transmission locally. How, um, uh, how can modelers use that information to inform and, 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 and sort of a, a advice policy and, and, and response? Mark? Yeah, no, so a critical part of uh, the modeling is uh, trying to uh, merge together different data sources. And one important data source is uh, the interaction between people, so how people interact. And uh, obviously, again, I mean, it's about how much information you have. But uh, in terms of modeling, uh, we do and uh, kind of uh, integrate this with uh, uh, amount of contacts, so obviously the structure of contact in the population in London might be different from in the north or um, in depending of uh, how in, uh, affluent is the area as well. Or as um, Ivan, Ivan was saying before, I mean, if you have to work, obviously you, mean that you, you make more contact. So all the structure, you can put it in model and it will change the dynamic. But the problem obviously is when uh, we don't have this information, then we cannot put it. And again, it comes back to the importance of uh, being able to talk with people in the field uh, who have a knowledge and, and might know what, is, uh, what are the drivers for, for transmission. Okay, thank you. Now, uh, it would be remiss of me not to address the numerous questions we've had from the audience about uh, the track and trace uh, system and how it's working uh, locally. So there were a number of questions before this and while we've been online um, asking how the track and trace system is supporting local response. And um, there has been a recent announcement to move more resource to local to support the response from there. Um, there was also some questions about the app, which um, I don't think I, any of us on this panel are in the position to answer. So Ivan, I'd start with you. Um, how has track and, uh, um, test, uh, track and trace, um, how is that system working? How um, has it changed to uh, push more resource to the front line to local level? How has that 
improved or changed things. Right, so this is the point where I've got to try and be a bit more diplomatic, I think. <laughs> um, test and trace has got, has got issues, you know. Um, it's, it's, not, it's not there yet. It's, it, it has not been there uh, for a while, but we're, we're trying to improve that. So I think the challenge that we had before, which is about having a central system where people came through sort of that pillar three uh, mm -hmm. wrote, and we tried to contact people uh, and, and follow them up. Uh, I, I think a number of DPAs have been quite vocal about uh, the concerns that they have about the level of coverage where we are sort of one hand tied behind our back if we've got say only 65% follow up, which is what you're seeing in many areas of the country. Of, of positive cases being followed up for, then getting contact. Mm -hmm. That leaves an inordinate amount of people that are not followed up and, and, and able to carry on going around their communities. Um, mm -hmm. So one of the things that we, we initiated in Leicester, and it's, by, it's not done or dusted by any stretch of the imagination, there's a long way to go, which was those individuals that Test and Trace couldn't contact within the first 48 hours and um, that those individuals should be passed across to the local authority. Uh, we have a, a number of routes that uh, we, can, we can get in contact with people, particularly when we start talking about households. You know, we know that if we call one person, the chances are we can get the other members of the household uh, at the same time. The way that the central system was set up was it takes everybody as an individual, which is ludicrous, really, mm. um, uh, and then wondering why you can't, you can't contact everyone. Uh, and since that's happened to us, we have been able to follow up between 85 and 90% of those individuals that have been put our way. Mm -hmm. The push that we're on now is to really say, well, twofold. First of all, can we move from that 48 hours to 24 hours letting us have those individuals? Because what we know with any, it doesn't matter what your, 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 you know, the disease that we're trying to control is, the earlier, the better. Mm -hmm. um, and anything we can do that, that supports that is what we want to do. So that's what we're pressing for now. I think equally we have a bit of a, uh, it doesn't work well in, in, in the sense of um, even when we find those cases that people have not been able to get in contact with, there is still the issue around contacts. Uh, and at the moment that's going back into the national system. So we've got to find a way just to make it a lot smoother, a lot more local, uh, and actually to be able to address the, the, the contacts that are that are found with, within there. I mean, some of the contact figures, certainly for communities like ours, where I'm seeing, you know, the reported contacts are two or three people. We know that can't be true. You know, there's going to be a lot more than two or three people, and maybe it needs a bit of more of a, a, a softer conversation with the local, with people from the local authority that they know to start to be a lot more open and honest about who they may have come back. Because the only way we're going to kind of break the transmission is really identifying the people and then stopping them from, from passing it on. So there's a way to go on it. Indeed, thank you. Um, and Mark, I was going to ask you that question about the percentage of contacts that we're able to, to contact and, and uh, test. Um, what difference does it make in terms, what, would the, what are the models saying about controlling these outbreaks if, as uh, the data is suggesting, we're only reaching two thirds of, of the contacts. And we do recognize that the figures don't represent the actual uh, total that might be contacted, but just because the service uh, hasn't reached them doesn't mean that the message hasn't reached those individuals, especially if we're looking at transmission within uh, families and intergenerational transmission. So what, do the, what does the modeling suggest about an optimum or minimum threshold for contact tracing that will help to contain uh, local outbreaks? I mean, it's a very good question. I mean, uh, obviously, there's a lot of parameters, so it's difficult to give uh, one number and one answer. Mm. It depends on uh, uh, what the R. So obviously, if the R is 1.5, uh, uh, as we hope, we, we're not getting but we might get at some point is different from EBR is free like it was at the beginning of the uh, COVID uh, crisis and uh, now probably R is about one maybe a little less. So this first vari variable depends on, on what's the dynamic at the moment you're talking. Mm. Um, but obviously I mean it's a race uh, between uh, the transmission uh, for the virus and the transmission of information uh, to be able to uh, control. So um, the problem obviously is that if you have exponential growth, so it's, it's 
why, why this R number is important as well is like if you have exponential growth, it means that the small uh, number of people you're missing, this small number of missing people are exponentially growing. So there's also, um, it's why the delays are so important as well, is because maybe there's, there might be a trade-off between uh, reaching a, a, few, a few less people that are having shorter delays. So, I mean, all of this together, so what I'm saying is that the, the dynamic of transmission is important, the delays in, in doing things is important, the adherence of the people, uh, because they might be rich, but they might not uh, uh, adhere to, to the, the rules. Uh, all of this uh, is to take into consideration. But, but I, I agree with um, all what has been said is very concerning that the uh, distant uh, trade system is at the moment not um, to the level we would like. Excellent. Thank you for that. There is, we have so many questions and we're coming to the end of our time. So I'm just going to put a couple of two key questions to just one individual each. Uh, we have had a lot of questions about a second wave. Um, and um, one of the, the senior uh, leaders in WHO has actually um, have commented on this being a continuous first wave. So what is a second wave? What do these local outbreaks have to do with a second wave? Are we, are we beginning to plan, anticipate, are we moving into a second wave? And I'll, I'll put that question to Lilith first. Sure. I mean, well, there's, there's no exact definition of a second wave, um, as <laughs> we all know. Um, but I would characterize it as kind of a sustained increase in transmission across broad geographical regions, um, mm. potentially resulting in our healthcare systems coming under significant strain and disruption. Mm. Um, and calculating the regional R is going to be our best signifier that we have that we have entered a second wave. Mm. Um, to touch on your point about can these local outbreaks perhaps become a potential second wave if not managed correctly, mm. um, my short answer would be yes. Mm. So, um, so there's been a very important study released, I think today actually, um, led by Helen Ward at Imperial, uh, the REACT study, mm -hmm. which has done um, systematic serological testing of over 100,000 participants um, all around England. Um, and they found um, cumulative infection rates and seropositive, well, cumulative infection rates adjusted for um, the um, specificity and sensitivity of the tests of between mm -hmm. three and 13%, um, depending on each region. Mm -hmm. So what that means is that we're nowhere near the level of population immunity that we would need to prevent the occurrence of a second wave. Mm -hmm. um, and so recent modeling that work that we worked on for the Academy of Medical Sciences showed that in a worst case scenario of a second wave, we could see a peak of a similar size to the first. So I would emphasize heavily that's not a prediction, but rather an illustration of the potential that is there in the population for a second wave. Mm. Um, and we did see in the first uh, wave that local outbreaks that spread from London to, be, to become that first wave. Mm. So yeah, in, in conclusion, the conditions are all there and it's only gonna be our success in preventing and managing these local outbreaks as, uh, as Ivan so successfully has done, that's mm. gonna be stopping that second wave from happening. Thank you. So our key, our key response to preventing a second wave is managing the local outbreaks effectively and hoping for a vaccine. I agree with that. <laughs> Thank you. Now, um, we're in our last minute and I'm just going to ask for a single sentence response um, to um, uh, Ivan. Um, what about this pandemic keeps you up at night? You said it, vaccine development, because I'm just managing until that happens. Thank you. Um, Mark? I mean, it's really trying to, to do my best to help um, people to, like, like Ivan, or <laughs> to control the, the outbreak. Excellent. And Lilith? Mine, uh, partially and in common with a lot of people who have been involved in pandemic response is the sheer workload. Um, and um, also combined with the surreality of, living, of modeling an epidemic while being a part of it. Indeed, indeed. Now, um, Ivan, I'm going to give you the last word um, uh, in the spirit of the clear line of sight from the front line to the government. What will be your single message to the Secretary of State about local outbreaks? I think one of the things that we've just got to really be clear on is that it's, it's the point that was raised before by, by Lillis really. Um, this has not gone away. It, it, it's still here. So when we stop talking about easements and it's all going to be okay, but we've got to stop that narrative. Um, I, I have huge issues with, with things like, you know, eat out to help out. I understand the economic, the economic issue of it, but when I'm walking up my road and I'm seeing people queuing up 
it, it, it's a concern. We've just got to get a very clear narrative of where we are, be in control, be cautious, make sure that we're not giving this, this virus the opportunity to pass on, because it will. Indeed. Right. Um, so um, I'd like to thank my panelists uh, for being so open to these very challenging and difficult issues. Like uh, a colleague of mine said, we're building the ship while sailing it. Yeah. Um, so I'd like to th thank uh, Lilith and Mark and Ivan um, for participating in this panel session and you, the audience, for, for joining us. And to mention that the next COVID-19 webinar will be next Thursday, the 20th of August, and the subject will be testing. Uh, and it will be featuring Sir John Bell, the Regius Professor of Medicine at Oxford University. So thank you once more for um, staying with the Royal Society of Medicine series and uh, look forward to seeing you again. Thank you.